Okay, how's that? Today wraps up our sermon series on Paul. And we've followed him from his conversion experience on the road to Damascus. And we've talked about his life and the struggles that he went through, the battles he fought. We talked about the beliefs that were most important to him. And today we end by talking about Paul's understanding of community, his understanding of community. You know, his letters, they were all written to communities. He wrote to churches throughout what we would call Asia Minor, mostly what's now called uh, Turkey um, and the Middle East. He wrote those letters to tell those churches how they should live together. And when Paul uses the word you, he's always talking to the community. I, I was taught Greek by a, a guy from Texas. <laughs> A thick southern accent. Actually, every language I've ever learned or been taught was taught by someone with an accent. I was taught Latin by a woman with an English accent, was taught Hebrew by a woman from Minnesota, and taught Greek by a guy from Texas. Anyway, my Greek teacher used to say that Texan or southern dialect was superior because it had a second person plural, y'all. <laughs> and anyway, it, it is in Greek, there's a distinct form for that. In English, you, singular, is the same as you, plural. In Greek, it's different. And anyway, the point is, all of Paul's usages of the word you are plural. So he's always speaking to a community. So community was very important to Paul. And in this passage, he talks about his vision for a community. He likens it to a human body. Listen for the word of the Lord. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor. And our less respectable members are treated with greater respect. Whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving greater honor to the inferior member that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. This is the word of the Lord. Be First thing that the Bible, well, that God in the Bible says about human beings is what? You remember what is God, the first thing God says about human beings? They're good. You remember the second thing God says about human beings and about human nature? He says, it is not good for them to be alone. It is not good to be alone. We were created, in other words, for community. We were created for relationship, created to live in community. And so for Paul, we may be saved by an individual act of personal commitment, but you cannot stay that way. You cannot stay an isolated individual. If you are saved, then you are made part of a community. You are grafted into the body of Christ. That's why St. Cyprian said, He cannot have God for his father who will not have the church for his mother. Salvation and community go together. Think about the little book of Ruth. The story of Ruth is a story of a widow from Moab, which was a pagan nation, worshiped pagan gods, but Ruth gets married and she forms a bond with her Jewish mother-in-law, Naomi. And when Ruth becomes a widow, she joins Naomi, she returns back with Naomi 
to the land of Israel, and she becomes a true Israelite. She becomes an ancestor to King David and, for Christians, an ancestor to Jesus. Do you remember what Ruth's pledge is to her mother-in-law? Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. She first pledges loyalty to the people, and then, and only then, to God. Loyalty to the community and loyalty to God always go together in the Bible. Always. But we live in an age that we might call spiritual but not religious. People say that all the time. You heard people say that. I'm spiritual but not religious. How many of you heard that? Pretty much everybody. I'm not always sure what it means. And on it, to be fair, I think it means something different to everybody who says it. I'm, I'm spiritual but I'm not religious. And it's unfair to judge all of them with one big stroke, but I think a lot of the times it really means I'm spiritual but not religious means I don't want to be part of a community. And there are many reasons why someone might not want to be part of a community, and it would also be unfair to judge everyone the same. But some of the time, when people don't want to be part of the community, it's just because it's hard. It's, it's harder to be part of a community. It's harder to get along with people because people are hard to get along with. It's easier to just be an individual at home. It can be hard to, to volunteer for things, to be asked to be, to be part of committees. Committees are hard. It can be easier just to find God in the sunset. It's hard to study an ancient tradition and read old books that were written thousands of years ago. That's difficult. It's easier just to decide what you believe on your own and believe what suits you. Some of the time, the folks who are spiritual but not religious are just saying that they don't want to work that hard to be part of a community. And it is, it is hard. I'll never hide that fact from you. It's difficult to be part of a community. A community is like a building or like a body. A building needs rafters, it needs girders, it needs a structure under it, a foundation, and a body needs bones and organs. And while the outside, what you see up here on the chancel, the songs are very beautiful, the sanctuary is beautiful, sometimes, sometimes the guts and the bones aren't always beautiful or fun, but they're necessary. A building needs girders, a body needs bones. It's like the writer Jean Kerr once put it, put it. He said, they say beauty is only skin deep, but what do you want, an adorable pancreas? <laughs> it, it might be hard to be part of a community. It, that committee meeting that you'll be asked to join, that committee meeting might be tedious, but what do you want, an adorable pancreas? The bones and the guts of the church are as necessary to it as anything that is uplifting and comforting and beautiful on the outside. All that spiritual uplift you enjoy about the church couldn't happen if it weren't for those bones and those pancreases that are doing the committee meetings. The folks who are cooking in the kitchens, folks who are sweeping and mopping the floors, the people who put together our live stream and set up our Zoom and our internet, the people who write the pledge letters and count the money and send out the dues letters. It might not be spiritually uplifting on the outside, but those are the bones and the guts of a community. And they're important. Those duties, that hard work is important. But what makes the church different? Have you ever wondered that? There's ways to have community right here in Nampa that don't have anything to do with church. There's country clubs, there's political groups, and those are all fine. There, there's groups centered around hobbies. What makes the church unique or different? What sets it apart from those other communities? The answer is that the church doesn't seek any agenda of politics. It doesn't seek wealth. And it doesn't seek any kind of entertainment. The church is a community that seeks truth and eternal truths. One of my favorite 
poems is by Alfred Tennyson. And the name of the poem is Ulysses. In that poem, Ulysses, who's the say, he's Odysseus, is the Greek version of his name. Odysseus is an old man. He's come home from that famous battle, the Trojan War. He's come home from his journeys, and now he's getting into his last years. But he becomes, he becomes bored. He finds that he has nothing in common with his fellow citizens of Ithaca, and, and he says in these famous words, that open the poem. It little profits that an idle king by this still hearth among these barren crags I meet and dole unequal laws unto a savage race that hoard and sleep and feed and know not me. Lots of people seem like they're content to just hoard and sleep and feed. But there are those like Ulysses who are dissatisfied with that, who are looking for something more, searching for deeper truth. And the church is simply a community for people like Ulysses, who are not content simply to hoard and sleep and feed, but who want to together search for the eternal truths and the ultimate realities. In our culture, I think the ultimate reality is probably the price tag. And in a culture like that, it is of no surprise that more and more people are lonely. Numerous studies have shown this, that loneliness is rising. I read an article the other day about the U.S. Surgeon General, and it said this. I'll quote the article. It says, Americans are facing an epidemic of loneliness, <clears throat> an underappreciated public health crisis that needs to be brought to light, said Surgeon General Vivek Murthy in a statement last week. Even before the COVID-19 pandemic, about half of adults in the country reported measurable levels of loneliness, which can affect mental, physical, and societal health. In response, the Surgeon General has issued a new public advisory to call attention to the mounting problem. Well, Paul understood loneliness. I think that when he became a follower of Jesus, he lost all of his friends, may have lost his family. We know that he was never married, never had children. With, with all of his traveling, it's hard to imagine him putting down roots anywhere. Paul, I think, must have been a lonely man. It's probably part of why he wrote so often to the churches that the church, you, should be a family to each other. Look around. No, seriously, look around. Paul would tell you to treat these folks as family, to share your life with each other. Loneliness is an epidemic in our society, and that's one thing our church can offer this community that I know it needs, is a refuge, a place to escape, a cure for loneliness. Whenever I think of loneliness in the church, I, I remember this woman. A woman none of you know. She was a member of my former church back in California. Whenever I think of loneliness in the church, I think of her. I can tell you her name because she's long since gone to be with the Lord and she had no family, at least none that ever visited her. Her name was Helen Orr. And I'll admit she was not the easiest person in the church to visit, to tell you about her. She lived alone. She lived by herself in a retirement home. And there were nurses there that worked in this home. She had long since given up her car, but she'd always been an avid smoker. And she used to ask her deacon, who at the time happened to be my wife Sarah's mother, to bring her cigarettes. Because don't you know, those mean nurses would not let her go out and buy cigarettes. Can you believe it? <laughs> well, Sarah's mom is no sucker. But it turns out her future son-in-law was. <laughs> so when Sarah's mom, her deacon, wouldn't bring her cigarettes, she turned to me. And I felt like I was smuggling things into a prison. <laughs> and in a way, I guess I, I kind of was. Because those, those homes, if you don't have anyone visiting you, if you're lonely and there's no one coming to see you, they can feel like a prison. That's the way Helen felt. But this nursing home would not send, not send her to the gas station for cigarettes, but would send her in the bus. The nursing home had a bus and would send her every Sunday to church. She came to church every Sunday on that bus. You could find her out in the parking lot afterwards smoking a cigarette every Sunday morning. And when I would visit her during the week, 
most of what we talked about was church. And I'll tell you, it was all complaining. All the time, complaining. Complaining about the church. The sermon was too long, didn't make sense. The music, it was too loud, and the songs were unfamiliar. The children were disruptive. People weren't dressed appropriately. It went on and on and on. Everything wrong with the church. One day, I just asked her, I said, if there's so much you don't like about church, why do you come? And then she told me that she came because that was the only time every week that anyone ever showed her affection. The only time she ever got a hug. The only time anyone ever touched her for some other reason than to give her medication was at church. She taught me that one of the most glorious things that a church can do is give affection to the lonely and the grumpy. They often go together. That is one of the most beautiful things the church can do, and there is no ministry of this church or any other that is more important than that. So Paul, I think that's why he wrote to his churches over and over again to love each other, to treat each other as family. And I love these words. The way he puts it in Romans is he says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. That's his command. It's his command to you. Share in each other's joys. Share in each other's sorrows. Weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. That's what you need to do. We just had new members join. You want to know what I or what the Bible really, what the Bible expects of members of this church is that. That is what is expected of you. Share in each other's lives. Share in their joys and their sorrows. That's your calling as members. No one can do it for you. Only you can do it. No leader can make this happen without you. It's up to you. And over the years, I've been doing ministry now, close, getting there to 20 years. And I've found that the one thing that determines a church's success more than any other thing is how well the members of the church love each other. How much effort they put into getting to know each other. And it's sad news for me. It's not the eloquence of the pastor. It's not the skill of the worship leader although he's very good. But what determines the church's life is how well you love each other, how well you welcome people into your intimacy, how you treat those newcomers, those folks who might be lonely and maybe even grumpy, who don't have anywhere else to fit in. That's up to you. So Paul talked about this all the time. I found online this pastor, he had summarized for his church what all of Paul's letters basically look like. This is the general outline of every Pauline letter, and it goes like this. This is every, every letter of Paul is the same. It starts out with grace. I thank God for you. Hold fast to the gospel. For the love of everything holy, stop being stupid. And Timothy says hi. <laughs> That's pretty much it. Now that... <laughs> that might not get you an A in a seminary class, but any seminary student will tell you that that is not wrong. That is not inaccurate. Paul spent half of his letters asking his congregation, begging his congregations to get along, put aside their petty squabbles, and just get over it and love each other. Community is the most important thing about our church. That's why I say every Sunday, and I ask you to come next door and be part of our fellowship. Because it's just as much a part of our ministry as the sermon or anything else. Love each other. Share each other's joys. This is my prayer for you, and this is how I'll close. May you be as loyal to each other as Ruth was to Naomi. May you get along. May you share each other's joys and may you share each other's sorrows. Let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks that through Jesus you created the church, that we are saved as individuals, but we never stay that way. We are saved and baptized into a family, a community that is a body. 
We give you thanks for the bones and pancreases of that community, just as much as for the things that are comforting and uplifting. We pray that you would give all of us, every member, every staff member, and me too, give us the holy calling to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll now bring forth our tithes and offerings. There are plates in the back, and you're welcome to give there. But take this time as a time of meditation and think about how you might offer yourself.